yes, I'm asking, and yes, you guessed it. I'm looking for a couple more volunteers for the nursery in the back. Um, blessing families so that they have a safe place to drop their babies off and just enjoy the service. Uh, we are down to where it's just one service a month and a couple more people, and it will be even less than that. It'll And the team that we have right now is amazing. So if you think that you want to be a part of that team and give a little bit of your time, please reach out to me. Um, let me know, and I look forward to working with you. Thank you so much for listening. Stand if you're able. Everybody feeling good tonight? All right. There's a place where mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place where streams of grace. in our hearts and help us to lift you up in the praise and worship you deserve and um, fill this room with your presence Lord I pray for that and I pray that you keep us humble keep us teachable 
help us to grow in love and truth and help us to give up the things we need to give up, Lord, to serve you better. Thank you for being with us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Barely here. 
good evening. How's that? You hear me back at all? Am I turned on? There we go. Um, hey, before we get into a couple things today, I wanted to uh, have Tiffany up here to talk about. Have you guys seen the advertisement, by the way? Can, it seems like I'm quiet. Keith, can you hear me out there? Turn it up a bit, maybe? Okay, just a little bit more. So, anyways, you haven't seen the advertisement for this Enneagram thing that we're going to be doing? Okay, so I wanted to share a little bit about this and talk about kind of how that's going to work out. But do you remember me recently talking about how we're going to start raising the leader bar uh, or the bar for our leaders' expectations? And uh, so we want to do that. And we want to train our leaders well. I heard a guy say it, and Craig Groeschel says, when our leaders get better, everybody gets better and benefits from that. And that's true in ministry. And we're in the business of people. Do you know that? We're trying to reach people. So the better that we can understand people, the better that we can serve them, reach them, understand them, love them where they're at, and hopefully lead them to Christ. So I'm encourage you, if you're a leader of the church, I really, really strongly urge you to make a point of going to that. But go ahead and why don't you share a few things about it. And I actually have a clipboard to pass around for our leaders. But go ahead. Convince everybody why they need to be there. <laughs> okay. um, anyone have wanted to take a personality test? Sting, I'm sure that many of you have done personality typing before. Uh, but the Enneagram is actually kind of unique in that it also uh, helps you to see the different aspects of your personality and helps you grow and helps you recognize right, is the pieces in you that maybe you can work on to have healthier relationships, to have a healthier life. Um, and actually... Although it is not at its core a Christian thing, it has a lot of reflections of Christ in it. And so we're going to be looking at how we're created in Christ's image, but also we are sinful and that ways that we can look at our personality and the ways that we can grow and be more healthy and be more like Christ and how we can then live in a healthier community together, not just as a church, but also just our relationships with each other. So I'm super excited about it. I know that some people are intimidated because they're like, oh my gosh, it's nine hours, but it's going to be a really fun day, I think. We're going to have lunch. Uh, there's child care if you need it for a small fee. Um, we're still working on who is doing that, but um, it's coming. Um, so if you have any questions, I will be here tonight. I'll be here next weekend too. That um, If you have any questions, you want to come talk to me about it, again, sign up. It's going to be really great. I've been using the Enneagram for a couple years as a tool to really help um, for God to actually help me be a healthier person, to have healthier relationships. It's just a tool that God has used to really help me see the ways that I'm kind of blind to unhealthy patterns in my life. So I really, really hope that you'll join us for that uh, and come with an open heart. And I promise you will leave so happy that you were there. So thanks. All right. I tell you what, uh, so early in my life, uh, or in my Christian life, I should say, God told me he was going to get me into ministry, and then the moment that he spoke that to me, I was excited, but it took about eight years before I actually got into ministry, and a lot of it was refining my character. It was teaching me things, and one of the biggest lessons I had to learn is to understand where people were coming from that weren't like me. Have you anybody, okay, let's be honest now, have you ever, uh, anybody married here? Anybody ever feel like you just don't understand your spouse, like you're just not always connected on the same vibe? Raise your hands. Y'all done it now. Stop it. Every one of us who have been married at one point thought, are they crazy? Right? So, um, and that's true in ministry. There are people that we want to meet, and I couldn't understand because I wear my emotions on my sleeve. I overtalk. I communicate everything. I overthink. I'm not saying that's the way you should be. That's just the way that I am. So then when I run into other people who didn't just vomit everything onto me the first time I met them, I was confused. Um, I'm extroverted. My wife is introverted. And, uh, and it took me eight years to really understand that everybody's different. And if I really want to minister well and have healthy small groups, healthy ministries, then I've got to understand other people. And here's the other thing. I'll go back to what Tiffany said there is that God wants to peel back layers in your life. There are things about your own heart that you don't even know. Did you know that? Things that go back to your DNA. Maybe you were raised a bad experience you had in a relationship. But those things affect who you are now. And if, you, if, you're, if you're aware of that, you can use that and leverage that for the kingdom of God. If you're not aware of it, it'll actually hinder you. So I really urge you, if you're a leader, please sign up, come out. We're going to get better. We're doing all this training. We're building out the church. And by God's grace, we're going to move to uh, that church over there. And we're going to have these amazing small groups. And we're going to just impact the community. Can I get an amen? amen. So what we're going to do is pass this around. No guilt, but you better sign up. But, uh, so sign up for that if you're interested. Um, a couple quick things here before we get going. I just want to do a quick shout out to the Kilby family, Steve Kilby. We got the Shelly, of course, and Terry. They're down in the cities today. The hospital allowed them to go visit, even though they haven't been allowing people there. And they said they're going to watch today. So once again, uh, we love you guys. 
We're praying for you. As you know, Steve is going through a lot of difficult things. He needs our prayers. In fact, let's just pray right now for him and the family. Father, I want to lift up Steve and the entire Kilby family. Lord, I can't imagine what they're going through, uh, the difficulty, the pain, the confusion. But Father, I know this, that you're a good God and you're a loving Father. Lord, I pray that you begin to move in this situation. Father, I would pray that it would be a trophy of your grace as you would begin to heal him and his life would be one where he could go around and testify of your goodness. Father, I, I pray whether it's a miracle, God, because you're the God of miracles that hasn't changed, or whether it's through the doctors, but either way, Father, I would pray that you begin to heal him. I pray against discouragement in his heart and for the family. I pray that even right now, as we are praying this, dear God, that you just begin to minister and do a great work. And so, Father, we pray that you be with Steve and the entire family. And show us as a church how we can support them and love them in this very, very difficult time. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Anyways, uh, just shout out to them. Uh, love Terry and Steve and the entire Kilby family. Hope they're doing well. Um, this church is being hammered with COVID. It's like it's moving on from one family to the other. So continue to pray. I think, you know, Jen's coming over right now. We had... Um, uh, was it Emily and her family is dealing with COVID? So, I mean, just going from family to family to family. So, keep praying for the church. Uh, I want to thank you guys real quickly. As you know, we're going to be redoing Renew Church coming up here, and we need to get a few things. And uh, um, we went through last week some of the things that we're trying to redo and see if you want a partnership with us on this one. And so, I don't know exactly. There we go. Because remember this last week? We talked about some of the things here that we needed to get to purchase to, uh, to go through this. And I don't know why that's not working for some reason. There we go. Um, these are a few of the things that we are going to be going through here. Some of you guys have already supplied money. In fact, last week we had some good donations come in. We had some come in tonight. So we're really close to covering all the costs for Renew. We're not quite there. We still have a few more things that we have to buy. I think the biggest one we have to buy is mugs. And then we also have to redo the incorporation paperwork. That's going to be roughly $1,000. So uh, thank you for the donations. We're almost there. If you do decide to give to help support this, we'd ask you to give above and beyond your normal offering because we have to get our offerings up and so certainly don't want you to take away from that i'll get yelled at by our, our some of our deacons so um once again i just want to go through some of the things we hear anybody getting excited for our launch on april there anyone no yeah yeah let's do it are you more excited about our launch or the super bowl thank you at least you better say that even if you don't mean it so Anyway, so, yeah, these are a few things that we're trying to get ready for there. So, thank you for the contributions. Continue to pray for that. As we get closer, we're going to tell you what that week will look like when we launch Renew and what you can do to help make that a wonderful week. I'll tell you, in the meantime right now, the biggest thing that you can do, anybody know? Pray. pray. Just continue to pray for that week. We want to do that week and to reach out to a lot of people and have a real time of celebration here. So, let's get to tonight's message. I'm going through the, the book of 1 John. It's a great book. He talks about the different evidences or signs that we can know that we are a child of God, truly born again. Now, one thing it says here, I'm going to go ahead and read it and break it down. We're now beginning. We finished chapter 2 last week. We're in chapter 3. So I'm going to read that and break it down and hopefully have some application for all of us. Now, here's what John says, chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. He says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we are called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are the children of God. It has not been revealed as we should be, but we know that when he is revealed, we should be as him. We will see him as he truly is. And everyone who has this hope in themselves purifies himself just as he is pure. So I want to take and break that down there just quickly. But I love what John does here. Um, if you remember last week, the end of chapter 2, he says some very challenging things. He basically tells us that if we're not practicing righteousness, if that's not like in our life, if we're not living a godly life, then we don't have any assurance that we're a child of God because it says whoever practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. So he gives us a really challenging statement, right? Like that's scary. Anybody ever hear that statement and wonder like, man, am, am, I, am I good enough? Am I practicing righteousness? Do I really show the marks of God in my life? Have anybody ever wondered that? Anybody ever wonder, like, man, if I die today, do, do I know for sure that I'm in? So he says that challenging statement, but now he shifts gears. And, and here he shifts gears, and he begins to remind us of what a great reward that we have. So last week, he's kind of challenging, like, hey, you know, if you're not practicing righteousness, you're not of God. But then he goes on to talk about this great reward, and I feel like what John's doing here, he, he's dangling a carrot in front of them. He, he's giving them motivation to keep our eyes on the prize. That's what he's saying. Like, yeah, I know that's hard. I know what I said must challenge you, but consider what a great gift that we have. 
So I think that that's not by accident that he does this. So I love what he says here. He goes on to say this. Behold what manner of love the Father has given to us that we are called children of God. Isn't that amazing? I thought about this week, and I thought, I don't know if we can really understand that statement. Like, as much as we try, I'm going to tell you right now, I don't think there's one person that's walking the earth that can fully grasp what an amazing gift that is. I think that it's, it's beyond human comprehension to think that I'm a child of God. It is beyond our understanding. As I thought about this week, one, I thought to truly appreciate that idea that you're a child of God. I, I think there's a few things that you need to do. One, you need to know and you must acknowledge this one truth, that you are not good. In no way, shape, or form do we deserve that title or privilege. you guys agree with that? Amen. Like, you just got to know that. Not like, oh yeah, of course I'm a child of God because I'm so awesome. If that's the way that you think, then you know what? You, you don't get it. So we begin with this idea that I, I'm not good. I don't deserve to be a child of God. And, and here's why. The Bible teaches that whom to much is forgiven, much loves. The idea is if you understand your true spiritual state, if you realize how undeserving you are, man, that gift is magnified. The gift means so much more if you realize how undeserving you are of that gift. Would you agree with that? Amen. So you've got to start right there. And I think when people struggle to get excited about the idea that they're a child of God, when they struggle to be sold out to God, it's either this, either they don't understand what an amazing gift that is, or they have misjudged their wicked heart, and they have wrongfully assessed what they deserve. Because, man, if you, if you understand your heart and what you deserve, and you understand what an amazing gift it is, it's got to change your life. And if it's not changing your life, then I think, man, I don't know if you get it. And i tell you what, sometimes in my life, I get apathetic. Anybody get apathetic in their faith? Or, you know, it's like kind of the world's getting kind of drawn them in. Right away, I've got to go back, like, do I really get what God has done for me? So I want us to consider this. Mankind sinned against God. We violated his law, and he didn't need to forgive us. He, he didn't have to do that at all. He could have gave us condemnation for all eternity, but he doesn't do that. He allows us a way to be forgiven. Like, that in and of itself is amazing. But here's what he could have done with that. He could have took this approach. He could have said, okay, everybody who's broken my law, you're going to be judged in hell for all eternity, but I will forgive certain people that have accepted my son, and he could have just annihilated us. You know what that term means? The idea of annihilation is basically like, okay, you won't suffer, you won't be punished, you'll just cease to exist. I mean, like, he could have done that, and that would have been okay. Well, hey, at least I'm not being punished for my sin. At least I won't have to go through that. But, but he doesn't stop there. He goes one further. See, he not only forgives us, but he gives us an entrance into heaven. He's like, no, no, I forgive you, but I'm going to allow you to go to heaven. And he could have stopped right there and just allowed us residence in heaven. Like, he could have been like, hey, I'll forgive you, and I'll let you come to heaven as a resident. But he doesn't stop there either. He says one more, I'm actually going to make you my child. See, isn't that amazing? I mean, when you consider what he did for us, I mean, that should just stir you up. Amen. That's our Father. That's what God did for us. Man, uh, does that make you excited and grateful? That should fill you with tremendous joy to think about what's happening. I want you to compare that to, to worldly things for a second and ask yourself, do I get excited about the idea that I'm a child of God as I do about other things? So think about something in your life right now, like when you got married, you got pretty excited, right? Anybody get excited when they got married? Yes. You know, okay, I hope you all did. Right now, I see there's a couple over here. They're fighting this. Yeah, it's going to... So, Jesse, you got to fake it. Is Heidi not faking it? So, oh, man, everybody get excited when we got married. Like, I couldn't wait for that day. I was so nervous. I'm going through the vows, and I'd like, I, I just, I, I, I like tunnel vision, and I, I just barely got all like, I do. Like, I was just so excited. Okay? Uh, it was so neat. Or, I grew up playing hockey. I've shared this with you guys before. And I remember, now, it's different nowadays. Like, they have traveling teams from the time you're really young, but when I played, because now I'm getting older, um, you had to be a little bit older before you could actually try out for traveling teams and make the A teams and, you know, get on these, these elite teams. And so I remember the first time I tried out for this team and, uh, and I wanted to make it. I grew up in a town that was really good at hockey. They've kind of fallen off a little bit, but back in the day, they were really good. They made tournaments. 
And I, I remember that you have 20 roster spots, basically, and 15 guys returned from the year before, so that leaves only five spots. And tons and tons of kids would try out for these teams. And uh, in fact, that team, that team that year ended up making it to the state tournament. That's how good they were. And, uh, and I remember trying out, doing everything I could. Um, I thought there's no way I'd probably make the team, although I, I hoped and dreamed it could happen. And uh, we went through all these tryouts, and then the night that they're deciding who's on the team, and we sit down in this room, and all the hockey players in this huge room, right? And, and earlier on the ice, and, the, and the people are out there scrimmaging, you know, having a practice game. And he stops the scrimmage, and, and he calls and 15 guys from last year off the ice. So like, yeah, of course, they're going in because they already made the team. And so we're scrimmaging. I'm like, you know, I hope the coach sees me. Oh, that was a nice move. Or, you know, oh, shoot, I screwed up. Hope he didn't see that, you know. And, and we go to the room that night, and he begins to, to list off the names of the players who made it. And, uh, you know, the first 15 are all predictable. He gets down the last five slots, you know, and I'm like, yeah, my heart's just going, you know, and I'm trying to be cool, but I'm like, oh, could I be in? Could I be on the team? Could I be one of the guys? Because here's the thing, if you made the team, everybody in town knew it. Even kids that didn't play hockey, junior high parents, you know, they would have you in the newspaper. It was pretty cool. And he goes through and he's rattling off names. And I'm like, oh, that's 16, 17, 18, 19. There's one more name, and, and I was the last name, and I made it. And, uh, and I was so excited. And I could not believe it. I actually went out and messed with my mom a little bit. I thought, oh, it's going to break her heart when her, her baby doesn't make it. So I, I, I wasn't a Christian, so I did a lot of shady things. But I went out there, and I looked all sad, and I threw my stuff in the trunk. And she's like, did you make it? I'm like, no. And she was, uh, she's like, well, I'm, I'm sorry, son. There's always next year. And I'm like, no, I'm just kidding. I made it, you know. And, uh, and then she's like, I'm going to kill you. But, um, but I was so excited. And I remember I was flying high forever. I couldn't wait to go to school the next day and let everybody know, like, man, I'm in. I'm on the team. You know, like, I couldn't believe that I was one of them. Does anybody have a story in life like that where you couldn't believe something that you were a part of? Well, how much more than to be a child of God? Do we react the same way to be a child of God? Yeah, I'm a child of God. Yeah, sure. Or, like I tell you what, it should be the number one thing in your life. It should really stir up your heart. Here's the thing. If we are his children, if we're truly born again, it's not just symbolic. This reality should change how you live your life, and it should affect what you do. It really should. Paul made this statement. I always thought this is kind of an interesting statement here he made. Okay? He talks about this right here. Um, he says, For you are still carnal, when there's envy, strife, and division among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? Well, that's really weird. Like, he's like, you're behaving like mere men, but, well, aren't we mere men? Aren't we just still human? No, you're not. You're really not just human anymore. See, you're no longer a child of the world. You're no longer a child of the devil. You're no longer condemned. You're not doomed by your father Adam's fallen sinful nature. You've been given a new nature. You've been spiritually reborn, and God's spiritual DNA is in you, so you're not just a mere man or woman anymore. Yes, you still have humanity. You're still going to make mistakes, but you should be different. And yet so many Christians today, they live just like the world, don't they? They don't look any different. They walk around in fear. They lack peace. They lack joy. There's nothing that will distinguish them from the world. But if you're a child of God, you should live differently, and you should stand out. You should stand out. Even if you never preach the gospel, which you should, by the way, people should look at you and just know, like, man, they're different. They look different than the world. Consider this. We have God's spiritual DNA in us. The Holy Spirit comes into you, gives you a new heart. He plants that seed. Now, I want you to compare that to, okay, we have the spiritual DNA of God. Compare that to, to human DNA real quickly. Um, we got some people here, by the way. Lindsay, how far along are you? When's your tentative due date? End of August, so that's exciting. You know, we have a lot of babies in here um, in this church right now. It's cool. Um, and I remember when babies are born, right, that they have mom and dad's DNA. And, like, right away you start to look for, you know, do they look like mom and dad, right? We've all done that one. The baby's born. Can you see, does it look like dad's side or look like mom's side? Even at a young age, even as a baby, you can begin to see some DNA in them from the parents, right? Right? Well, we carry the DNA of our father. How can we not, to some degree, look like him, even when you're a new believer? It's an impossibility to be reborn of God and not have God's spiritual DNA in you and not start to look like our father in heaven. It just happens. So we should be different if we're a child of God. 
Here's another thing. Being a child of God brings us benefits. Now, we don't come to God for the benefits, but I'm here to tell you there are many benefits. It's not just heaven. It applies how we live. If you're a child of God, you know what? That'll mean protection. At times, God will give you provision, care, and oversight. I want you to think about it for a second. How many of you are parents right now of kids? Okay? What would you do for your child? You die for your kid. You take care of your kid. You obsess for your children. You would do so much for your kids. Well, then how much more will our Father in heaven, who, by the way, is more loving than you and I, because he is love. And here's the thing. Our God is the source of love. He's perfect, all-knowing, all-powerful. He has endless resources. And if you would go to the ends of the earth for your child, then what would God do for you as a child of God? Do you live that way or do you live in fear? I think we live in a lot of fear, don't we? We've got to stop doing that. I want to ask you this question. Do you think that little cub is afraid? No. Like, it's not worried. And yet, don't we have so much more as God behind us as our Father? Come on. Let's go. Thank you. So God will supply for you. We need to start stepping out in confidence. Yeah. It should take away anxiety and fear. It should create a boldness in us, a confidence. It should give you peace and joy and a great hope if you're a child of God. Now here's the thing. I could wax on and on about being a child of God and I try to stir your emotions. Um, maybe I could tell you stories that would be really cute, make you cry, whatever, get fired up. But eventually those emotions will disappear. They will. Those emotions are going to go away. So here's my challenge for you guys today as we get to the next point. One, Live like you're a child of God daily. Stop acting like you're mere men because you are not. You've been reborn. Two, I want you to make it a point in your life to reflect on this truth deeply often. That you're a child of God and what does that mean for you? What does that mean for you when you get up in the morning, when you go to work, when you live your life? What does it mean to be a child of God? Begin to consider that. If you notice that it doesn't stir you emotionally, then I think you need to take a season to really contemplate that so that we don't take it for granted. So I want you to do that. And even if we begin to understand or grasp that depth of love that he has for us being a child of God, I think we're just scraping the surface. You all agree with that? Okay, I think on that day, our minds are going to be blown when we get there and we start to realize, that, oh my, this is so much better than I could have imagined. I will say this, though, to, to ignore that point or to take that point lightly, that you're a child of God, do you know that it actually dishonors and hurts God? It says in Hebrews chapter 6, it talks about, Paul said, hey, I want us to lead these elementary principles. Basically, like, grow up in your faith. Mature in what you're doing. He goes on to say, let's get perfected. And then he goes on to say this, for those people that were once enlightened, who had tasted that heavenly gift, who had partaken the Holy Spirit, tasted the good word in the ages to come, like, like, they had got it at some point. He said this, if they fall away, what they do is they just crucify the Son of God, and put Jesus to open shame. So when we don't take that seriously, if we take that lightly, I, I think it's an insult to God when he's done for us. Have you ever given a gift to somebody who just was really blasé about it? Have you ever, I remember one time at Christmas as kids, we were going through gifts and ripping through it, you know, and kids get excited. But we'd always try to train our kids, like, make sure to go stop and thank the person. But we're at somebody else's house, and this kid gets the last gift, and he just opens and puts it aside. He's like, is that it? And I just thought, whoa, like what a kick in the gut for, you know, whoever gave him those gifts. But if we're not careful, we can kick God in the gut, metaphorically speaking, when we don't appreciate the gift he's given us. So here's John continues. And here what John says here. He says this. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Here's a real simple one. If you're an authentic Christian, you won't fit into the world. That's it. Okay. And if you do fit in, I'm going to tell you it's not a good sign. Okay? It's not a good thing if you fit in. Now, I get it. Paul said, I won you with cunning. We should be cunning. We should become all things to all men that we could win them to Christ. Like, I get that. But ultimately, we are different. We have different values, how we live, our morals, our virtues, our priorities, and we should stand out. In fact, in Luke chapter 6, it says, Woe to you when all men speak well of you, because they said nothing but good things about the false prophets. If nobody has anything bad to say about you, it's probably a sign that you're not walking truly in the light. Compromise. You've compromised, that's right. So I want to ask us today, do we stand out? Are we different? 
Is it clear by our actions around other people that we are a Christian? It should be very evident in how we live. Jesus said things like, they hated me, they're going to what? Hate you. Now, now, here's the thing. I want to say this. Often those that don't like Christians don't realize they're even doing it or why they do it. Now, I want to say this really clearly. We will be hated for who we are, but we don't try to be hated. In fact, I'll say this. We labor very hard to convey love. Man, I will labor. I will go the extra mile. I overthink everything I do in my life. Anybody that knows me knows I overthink every word, every action, because I want to make sure it conveys love. But we never compromise truth in the process of it. Which means that if we don't compromise truth, no matter how loving we are, they're going to hate what we represent. And we have to be a light in this world. John 3 says this, and this is the condemnation that light has come into the world, but men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who practices evil hates the light and does not come into the light lest his deeds are exposed. See, even if you don't say a word, if you are a light, you're exposing things that they want to keep hidden. And they don't like that. So, once again, I grew up, I wasn't a Christian. Uh, just, you know, I know I've asked this before, but anybody grow up in here who was not a Christian growing up? Take a couple hands there. Okay. Hmm. Jarek, you, you're, you're a Christian now? Oh, okay. Sometimes it's hard to tell. I'm just kidding, brother. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, you know, I'm teasing you, brother. I love you. So, uh, I grew up and I wasn't a Christian. Okay. And um, I remember in school getting frustrated at the goody two shoes in school. You guys familiar with that term? Goody two shoes. Uh, the word actually means somebody who's ostentatiously virtuous or well behaved. Like, I didn't like those kids. They bugged me. Like, oh, you goody two shoes. Yeah, oh, you. You know, oh, you're so perfect, teacher's pet. Everybody ever think that? Um, sometimes we'd even pick on people like that. I'm not proud of that. I'm just being honest with you. But why do people hate the, the goody two-shoes? Well, here's why. Because their goodness reflects on their corruption. Them doing the right thing reminds others that they're doing the wrong thing. They're not living right. And that's how the world will look at us. When you're living godly and doing the right thing, even if you love them and never say a word to them, it's a reminder in their life that they're not living a way that's honoring God. That's what it's doing. Your godliness should reflect on their corruption to some degree. Prime example is you ever been around an unbeliever where like you've never like said anything, you've never condemned them, you never judged them, like you've been just gracious towards them, but you, they just apologize to you for things that they do. Oh, I'm sorry that I swear. I'm sorry that I've smoked. I'm sorry about this. You're like, man, I never said a word. Like, why are you apologizing to me? You ever see that? Okay. And you may not even think anything of it, but you know what's going on there? They have a conscience. And they know that you walking with God is a reminder that they are not walking with God. Now, some of the things that they think that are issues with God maybe aren't, but ultimately there's something inside that they know. We are reminded that they're outside God's will, that they're under condemnation. And to some degree, they understand it because we all have given a conscience. That's what we have to remember as Christians. Now, listen to this. Okay? Why do some unbelievers hate us? Why do some hate us? Well, 2 Corinthians says, Thanks be to God who always gives us the victory in Christ Jesus. And through us, diffuses his fragrance of his knowledge everywhere he goes. He's saying everywhere that you go, he wants to work through you to bring the fragrance or, or his knowledge to others. You're at school, your neighbor, your coworker. Is there a place where God doesn't want to bring that knowledge through you to others? Everywhere. When you step out that door, you're in a mission field. You know that? It's not just in Africa. Everywhere you go, he wants to do that. And here's what it goes on to say. That we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those that are being saved and among those who are perishing. So he's like, you go everywhere. Sometimes you run into believers, sometimes unbelievers. Now listen to this. Okay? To the one, we are aroma to death leading to death, and to the other, the aroma of life. He's saying to some, you smell pleasant, and to others, you stink. That's what he's saying. And here's what he's saying. He's saying around a believer, man, that fragrance of God's knowledge smells beautiful to them. You ever run into somebody and right away you find out they're believers, it's like you're just connected? Yeah. You're like, yes, I've never met you, but man, I can tell like we are brothers and sisters in Christ and I love it. Well, what he's saying though is around other people, we stink. Because God in us is a reminder of something that one, they're dying spiritually. 
what he's saying there. And so, to Christians, remind them of their salvation, but to unbelievers, remind them of their condemnation. So there's two things to consider when we consider that point. We're not going to fit in. We want to love really well. We want to go the extra mile, but we won't fit in. Some Christians struggle with that. Because I don't know about you, but I, I, I don't like being disliked. I, I just don't. Okay? Even if I know I've done the right thing in God's eyes, I still hate when people don't like me. Can I be real? So what will happen with some Christians, they hate that, so they'll compromise. And that's wrong. We're called to be the watchman in the watchtower, and God says if we begin to compromise or don't warn others or don't live godly lives, that ultimately will be judged for that. So as much as we may want to compromise, you, you can't do it. Pray that God will give you strength. And here's what I would encourage you. Let love for that person compel you to not compromise because you're not loving them when you compromise. The best thing you can do is be a Christ-like example in hopes that they come to Jesus. Okay, so that's one mistake. In fact, uh, you guys have been here on Sundays. You remember Eric Schroeder he comes here sometimes? Uh, he's from the cities, but when he comes up, he'll attend here. He called me this week. He said, I've got a daughter who, who's uh, actively, uh, she's homosexual. She's getting married this week. Uh, she's, you know, she's outside the will of God, and I love her so much. I was like, man, I just, I, I care for her. And, and if she never comes to Jesus, she never changed that lifestyle, he's like, she's precious to me. He, oh, but I also afraid that if I go to this wedding, then am I sending her the message that it's okay? But in his soul. Like, yeah, he's struggling so much with this because he wants to love her, but he wants to honor God. Here's another concern that happens at times. So one concern is that we compromise to fit in. Here, here the other concern is this. The idea that we're going to be rejected um, some people will use that as an excuse to act unloving, unchristlike, and kind of be a jerk, okay? So we're not going to fit in, but you should always be trying the best you can to overcome that and love. Don't just, because I've heard Christians say, like, well, I'm just not fitting in because I'm like Jesus. Like, no, you're not fitting in because you're kind of mean. Like, that's just the truth of it, okay? So don't use that as an excuse. John said this, has not been revealed what we shall be, but... We know that when he is revealed, we'll be like him, for we'll see him as he truly is. What is it going to be like when he comes back? How are we going to be transformed? I have no idea what it's going to even be like. I think to even begin to try to imagine what that's like is impossible. It is. Trying to describe what God is like and what awaits us is an impossibility. It says in 1 Corinthians that eye has not seen nor ear heard nor entered the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. He's like, you can't even begin to imagine. Like, you could try, but you're really not going to. And that's sometimes, you know, why I like to do movies that talk about his return or end time stuff. Because I always feel like no matter how well Hollywood tries, Hollywood falls short. Because none of us can really understand what it's going to be like. It's an impossibility. Paul said this in 2 Corinthians. He's talking about himself, but he said that he knows a man one time that was caught up to the third heaven. He went on to say that he went up to paradise and heard inexpressible words that are not lawful to be uttered. He's like, there are things that I heard that I can't even begin to express to you. Trying to understand what it's going to be like for us upon his return and how we'll be transformed, it's like trying to describe colors to somebody who's been born blind. How would you do that? It's like trying to explain quantum physics to a toddler. Good luck. Okay? Because in this world, our finite minds have a limited capacity to understand these things. In fact, I think if God were to try to, I think we'd actually go insane. I'm not even joking. I think it would actually kill us to truly get in the presence of God now in this world. Exodus 33, here's what Moses said to God. God, please show me your glory. But God said, I'll make all my goodness pass before you, and I'll proclaim my name before you. But God said, you cannot see my face, for no man can see my face and live. And the Lord said, here's what I'll do. I'll stand you in a rock, and when my glory passes by, I'll put you in the cleft of that rock, and I will cover you with my hand while I pass by. Then I'll take away my hand, and you'll see my back, but you will not see my face. After that happened, Moses was so changed by that interaction that whenever he communicated with people, he had to wear a veil because of the glory of God that shined off him. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Now you think you know what it's going to be like when God returns? Yeah, right. That's going to be crazy. Okay? Paul says this in 1 Corinthians. He says, We see in a mirror right now dimly, but then we'll see face to face. 
Right now, we know in part. In this world, our, our bodies, our minds are limited to fully understand what an amazing gift it's going to be. So what we have to do is have to have by faith. Man, by faith, you just got to know it's going to be unbelievable. And live your life like it's going to be unbelievable. Because it's going to be. Now that verse that I read about, we see in a mere dimly, it's preceded by a challenge that Paul said. He said, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child. I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mere dimly, but then face to face. That leads us to our next part. When you have that understanding, then there's expectations that lead to action. If you understand what's being said there, then it leads to actions. And in Corinthians, the expectation was, okay, because you understand what's coming, don't live like a child, grow up. Like a lot of things that are happening today in Christianity in America, it's because a lot of immaturity amongst believers that just need to grow up. They just do. Well, John, he gives us an action to the expectation, and here's what John said. John said this. Everyone who has this hope in themselves, once again, talking about what's coming for us, his return, our transformation, purifies himself just as he is pure. He's saying if you get it, then you're going to live a life and you're going to be to purify yourself. To truly understand what it means to be a child of God, to have that inheritance, a proper response is purifying your life. The idea of purification means to cleanse from sin, pride, selfishness, worldliness, to rid ourselves from things that are contrary to God. If you look at the word purity and sanctification, they have similar meanings and applications. They are separate from justification. They're different. Now, here, here's what I would say. Cleansing our lives, purifying it, is a work of God's Spirit. But God alone won't do it. Did you know that? He expects you to do our part. He expects you to cooperate, and we have a choice to purify yourself. Second Timothy, it says this. The Lord knows who belongs to him. Let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from sin. Any of you, have you ever named the name of Christ in your life? Any of you? I hope you have. It says, if, if that's you, then depart from sin. It goes on to say that in a great house, there are vessels of gold, silver, wood, and clay. Some for honor and some for dishonor. It says, if anyone cleanses himself from dishonorable living, he'll be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful for God, prepared for every good work. It goes on to say, lust, righteousness, love, faith, peace, with those that call the Lord on a pure heart. He's saying, man, the Lord knows who are his. He's saying, but if you've called upon God, then, then cease from sinning and begin to cleanse yourself from dishonorable living. He said, and if you do that, if you want to cleanse yourself, then God can use you as a vessel. It's this idea of a cup. Like, God wants to use you, but if the cup is dirty. You ever gone to the kitchen and you can't find any clean dishes? Some of you are, we have a lot of people in our house. Every once in a while, it's like it's hard to find a clean dish. Like, you know, um, and then I'll open up the dishwasher and they're, they're dirty because nobody hit the button because that's hard to do, you know? It takes, uh, uh. So, uh, so you realize what do you do when it's dirty? You don't eat with it. You realize that that vessel to be used has to be cleaned. Titus says this, the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. So he's talking about the grace of God, right? Usually we use the grace of God to, to compromise. We say, no, no, it's the grace of God that has actually appeared to you. And it's God's grace that teaches you to deny ungodliness and worldly lust that you should live soberly, righteously, and godly. And it goes on to say that God wants to redeem us and purify us. He sends God's grace to teach you to purify yourself. So when we look at God's calling and our response, he's called us, we had this wonderful reward, and now here's our response. We also see this in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and 7, here's what it says. It says, I'll be a father to you, and you'll be my sons and daughters. Isn't that amazing? He's like, I'll, I'll be your father, and you'll be my children. Okay? So there we have the promise, and it's beautiful. So now Paul continues, like, here's the promise, now here's our response. He says, I'll be a father to you, you'll be my children. Therefore, since we have these promises, let us cleanse ourselves and purify ourselves from all filthiness of the spirit and the flesh and perfect holiness in the fear of God. He said, hey, I'll, I'll be your father and you'll be my children. But because of that, then you need to go and purify your lives. 
We have to purify ourselves. We have to cleanse ourselves from ungodly conduct. But here's the key to success and longevity in that, okay? Purity begins on the inside and not the outside. It begins inside of us. And a lot of people get it backwards. You know who got this backwards? The Pharisees. They were all backwards. See, purity begins in our hearts, but they would do it on the outside. They would put on the front. They would dress the part. They knew how to act a certain way. They were hypocrites. But we don't want to do that. Here's what Jesus said. He said, woe to you. Scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but the inside is full of extortion, self-indulgence, and sin. Blind Pharisee, you clean the inside. What do you scribe and Pharisee, you hypocrites? You're like whitewashed tombs that appear beautiful to other men, but are full of dead man's bones. Even so, you outwardly appear righteous to men, but on the inside you're full of hypocrisy and sin. See, they, they knew how to put on the Christianity, but, but that's not what it is. It's not about the outside. If you want to appear here, it, it begins on the inside. I heard a pastor once say, and I love the analogy, he said, we, we, we get it wrong. He said, it's, what we try to do is we, we try to cover sin, we try to hide, we put up a front, but we never deal deep inside in our heart. He said, it's like this, a person with leprosy, and, he, and this guy was a missionary, and he'd seen lepers before. He said, you could find a leopard, and he said, like, you would smell them before you see them, stink. They could have sores on their body, pretty disgusting. Um, blisters, just, you know, lesions, you name it. He talks about how gross it was. Um, he said, you could feel bad for that person. I think, okay, well, here's what I'm going to do. Look at their body covered in sores. I'll go find the finest silk in the world, and I'll make a beautiful outfit for them, and I will cover up all those sores. And for a bit, it would look better. He said, but what would happen is those sores, those blisters, all that silk, it's going to bleed through it and ruin all that silk and reveal the corruption that's under it. See, if we don't deal with our heart from the inside out, it doesn't matter how much we put on a front. Titus, it says this, to the pure all things are pure, but to those who are defiled, sinful, and unbelieving, even their mind and conscience are defiled. They profess no works, but they deny. They profess no God, I'm sorry, but in works they deny him. So purity begins in our heart. That's why Jesus said many times these sort of things. The things that proceed from the mouth come from the heart. They defile us. For out of the heart proceed evil thought, or adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things that defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a person. It's, it's a heart issue. And so if we want to get serious about our walk and growth and sanctification, and we have to go deep inside. We have to allow God to dig things out that we don't want to see, things that we're not dealing with deep inside of us. It tells us that we should keep our heart with all diligence for out of its spring the issues of life. It starts from the inside out, but it's still a partnership. Some would argue that, well, Pastor Rob, even our desire to change is from God. And I would say, yes, that's true. God bursts a desire in us. He might be in you right now to go home and think, God, I want to seek you more. So that, that's God working in you. Praise God, right? But you have to act in accordance with the desire that God has given you and the power that he provides by his grace, he's not going to force you to do it. You're supposed to draw near to God. And he'll draw near to us. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your heart, you double-minded. Being a child of God comes with a lot of benefits. Do you know that? But also comes with responsibilities. Anybody know the royal family? Okay. Come on, I, ladies, I know, like you watch, who watches the royal family? What dresses they wear? They get married. One person raised their hand. One honest person. None of you ladies have done this? Okay. Jarek watches it all the time. He loves the royal family, their dresses. He's, he's always matching me on Instagram, like, do you check out her dress today, dude? Like, no. Okay, so. Um, so it, pray for Jarek, you know. He just, uh, but considered like the royal family, they have a lot of benefits. They have a lot of influence, a lot of money. They have a lot, right? But they also have a huge responsibility. To be a part of that family is a burden, Okay. They experience things that we can't imagine, but they have a responsibility. Everything that they do is measured or filtered through how does this positively or negatively affect the reputation of the family or public image. Did you know that? That's why that one uh, person just left the family. What's her names? Thank you, yeah. Because they got tired of the public pressure. See, we have a lot of benefits, but we do have a responsibility. And here's our responsibility. 
being a child is get, of God is great. But it, we, but it means that you and I carry his name in all that we do. And we are a child of God. And we have to represent God well in all things. If you believe that you are born again a child of God, praise Jesus for that. But let's now go out and live like we are children of God in this world. Act in faith, be bold, love, have courage and holiness. Man, I tell you what, it should embolden you. Last thing here, and then uh, the worship team can come up. But um, I grew up, and my family actually owned a lot of family businesses. They just did. They owned a miniature golf course and a floral shop, some things like that, and just some other family businesses that they had. And, uh, and I would love sometimes, because I didn't live there, but I would sometimes love showing up when they'd have a new employee working there. And I would just walk right in like I own the place. And I love seeing the employees react when I would go up and grab stuff off the shelf. I'd go grab some golf clubs and tell my friends, like, ah, go ahead, it's free. And then they'd be like, whoa, and I'm like, my family owns this, you know? And it just felt good. I was an arrogant kid, so anyways. But because I knew, like, that's my family. I have an inheritance. Well, you're a child of God. Just consider that in your life. Stop living in fear. Start living in boldness. Make it different in the world around us. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are called your children. Father, we acknowledge that we are not worthy. But Father, we thank you that you have loved us, not because of us, but in spite of us. Father, I pray for all of us that we would live that reality out. We reflect you in godliness and holiness, courage, faith, love, that we would not walk in fear. Lord, it, it's amazing, the gift that we have, even though I don't know if we can fully comprehend. Lord, I know it's a gift that others need to, to get a hold of. And Father, I would pray that you'd use us to reach other people. Once again, Father, we love you, we praise you, we thank you. Lord, we pray these things with humility and confidence in the name of Jesus. Amen.